You have uh, your your D and D hat on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I I have one question. <laughs> I have okay. Figured, what else I want to ask? I guess okay. I get to know this guy. Yeah. And what his involvement was. <laughs> Welcome to The Well. I am Brandon Edgems. And I'm Anson Mount. And we're doing a bit of a uh, throwback in this episode in a way. I mean, it's something old, something new. The new thing is that the D&D movie, Honor Among Thieves, has just come out. And it's, well, it's been out for a while now, actually. Uh, and we love it. We do. And and uh, what's old is that we used to play. So this is going to be a big... I was 13 years old when I got my advanced set. Yeah, been playing. I, well, I mean, I haven't played in a while. The last time I played was with you. We were in our thirties. Um, oh my god! Yeah, I know. I know. That's that's. I don't like to. Don't like it. <laughs> and now we're fifty. An hour fifty. Oh my gosh. Well, uh, I'm going to welcome our uh, guest Nathan Stewart, who is the VP of Marketing for Wizards of the Coast, who owns. Uh, well, he doesn't own, but Wizard of Coast owns the D&D intellectual property, and he was an advisor on the film, and we're going to let him in. And um, uh, do we need to do a, a, a sort of, I don't know, do we need to teach people what D&D is? I think, I think we can do that in the process. Okay, all right, let's do I that. think it, it, it will help with the, you know, the, with um, assistance, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do, 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 do. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> Yeah, it's our TNT group. Oh yeah, this is a different thing. Sorry, this is not. This is not Nathan. Oh, <laughs> oh my god! Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh wow! This is the, hey guys. We were, we were hey. just we were just saying that we we're that we were um uh 30s. We were in our 30s last time we played D and D. Heck. Wow. Well, except for Phil, how you were like you were like twelve, fifteen. I was uh, I was just rounding out uh, after my bot mitzvah. That's right. Yep, <laughs> I was uh, coming right on, coming right up on that. Absolutely. What's up, Phil? <laughs> What's and, going on, guys? How are you? And 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 true to form, Jordan is late, and I, Andrew is not contacted you. <laughs> <laughs> there we are. Here yeah, we, we are. We got almost everybody. Actually, we're the only person we're missing right now is uh, David, who's who I'm assuming might show up. Uh, Gordon. Gordon. I I just wanted to plan this little surprise for Anson because you know it's been a while. We haven't seen you know sat around and done this virtually and or or in reality in a long, long time. And yeah. I and we saw what 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 made me think of all this. It's the poster for the D and D movie. So who who here has seen it? Uh, I've seen it. I saw it. I haven't seen it. I loved it. Yeah, yeah, you loved it. I thought it was fantastic. I thought it was brilliant. Like I thought Chris Pine was terrific. I thought everybody in it. I mean, there's a couple of great uh, without spoiling everything. There's a couple of great um, cameos in there from artists that are like that are like, yeah. You know, it's like oh wow, you jump in here. Um, I thought you, Greg, was absolutely his beautiful, <laughs> charming, smarmy self when he watched me. He's really eating up these smarmy roles, which I'm thoroughly <laughs> enjoying. And, um, you know, they again, without spoiling, they had wonderful, like, D&D Easter eggs and, you know, the ge- the gelatinous cube men <laughs> parents. Like, it was yeah. awesome. It was and, brilliant. And, and the treasure chest that eats people. And, like, a mimic. A mimic. Yeah, the mimic. Yeah. And, but but that's I mean, but but the coolest throwback cameo in that whole thing was the Displacer Beast. That was oh, such that a fine cool. voice. I might I I really like the owl bear personally. That was oh yeah. Wait, what was the Displacer Beast? Displacer Beast. The, 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 the panther, panther with, the yeah, with the tentacles that tentacle like on it. make it look oh. like it's somewhere else. Yeah. Oh right. Uh, right. That's from Monster right. Manual right. One. Yeah. And can't they like? All yeah. of those were from Monster Manual One, actually. Oh, yeah. really? Yeah, yeah. Classic. Only yeah, the classics. Totally. No, uh, I thought it was a great movie. Completely. 
That's actually, that was going to be my question to the executive I thought we were talking to <laughs> is, uh, is whose idea was it to, to put in the displacer beast because I love that choice. Yeah. Also, I think one of the cleverest things about it is some of the meta uh, qualities like the, the, who's the paladin who shows up. Paladin. Yeah. yeah. Who's clearly a non-player character and who's controlled by the, controlled by the dungeon master. Yeah. <laughs> because, because he, because he can do everything. Like right. he, ne- he never screws up. He's just there to kind of solve little parts of the journey so that they, 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 they can, keep them on track. So they, they continue. <laughs> and then like at that moment where he like, where he leaves, he's like, they say he's a terrible conversationalist because like, he's not really, it's, it's the DM talking, right? He's not yeah. really a character. He is like, you're really boring to talk to. You have no sense of humor. And then at the end, he just walks off in a straight line and goes over the boulder instead of going around it. <laughs> <laughs> But who was that actor again? Was that the guy from Bridgerton? Yes. Yeah, he was really good. Like he was just there to like just completely like just here day that it completely served absolutely everything. Like he was so even keeled and amazing, and like just like wow, that guy's too cool for school. The, The the bridge collapse was just beautiful. Beautifully handled. I love that. I'll be that. You can even, you can even tell when they rolled. You can almost like see what they were rolling in certain cases. You know, like I can't remember. There's a place where a person like you know takes a swing at somebody and lets go of his sword. You know, and just loses his sword. And like, oh, that was a one. He rolled a one. Yeah, <laughs> but I I gotta say I miss I miss like having that the perspective of the of the player. Like I, I, and the mechanics of the game, and like, I, I miss that. I, yeah, I, how, how would you put that in the movie, though? Well, I mean, you, it, I, I've always thought that the way into to telling the story is to have it. I, I like the way that Pure Fantasy did, where you have, uh, you know, the the people, and then how their lives are mirroring the characters that they're playing. Narrator voice. Pure yeah. Fantasy is a D and D themed screenplay written by Anson Mount. Yeah, <laughs> um, which oh, which I love. That oh, I by the way, reading that it was good. We all we're we're, st- we're still boosters here. In fact, this is the real yeah. reason we're here, Anson, is we're trying to like <laughs> pitch you on this and get get moving on it. Anyway, they got the blur off. That's the poster. Okay, cool. Yeah. They, they, back when they do one sheets, this is at Alamo, and they actually had a one sheet in the lobby, which is very nice. cool. And you stole it? <laughs> no. <laughs> yes, I did. I stole one of several hundred that were laying in a pile. <laughs> um, uh, but anyway, we're kind of bearing uh, the lead here. How did this all start? Remember? We remember when we all got together? We had, none of us had played D&D since we were... I, I think it was, Brandon, I think... I think the... Correct me if I'm wrong. I think you and I were talking, and and I was like, "Well, why don't we just get a campaign going? You know, instead of instead of playing poker, let's do it like a Saturday campaign." Was yeah, that right? right? That was the thing. You guys had like a poker game that you play every now and then, and you invited me to one, and I think I lost everything in like 15 minutes. But it was nice <laughs> hanging out, and then I just politely declined all the rest, and then. Uh, I think it was Brandon called me and said, "Hey, man, uh, I know you don't love poker, but what would you say if I said a D campaign?" And I said, "You've got my attention." And, and we all got together and lasted how many years? I don't know, five I th- at least. I think. Really? Jordan, had you Jordan had you played before? I forget. So yeah, I, well, also I want to talk about my way in. Um, we were at the time Anton and I were doing a a show for. NBC or whatever and uh I walk by his dressing room and I see him like you know sort of over all these books and 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 then I kind of stopped and then walked back and I said are you playing D&D <laughs> and he was like maybe <laughs> and then I basically weaseled my way into the game I was like dude I want in <laughs> uh, um, and uh I also I also kind of uh touching on <laughs> The whole thing of that, some of the play, some of the group would like basically tell people they were playing poker. They wouldn't admit they were they were because it was still early days. There wasn't the big, you know. <laughs> it's become such a cultural thing. I mean, it always percolated there, but lately it's just crazy how much it's exploded, and people aren't embarrassed now. 
Uh, that's uh, Jordan Gore. No, no, we're going. No, that was it. Just that uh, I, I, I kind of weaseled my way in, and and um, I thought it was so funny about how, you know, the 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 line was that we were playing poker. I also, I, I also, I was just the weasel the way that I got into that whole, got into the group as well. And it was the first, it was the absolute first time that Ants and I had dinner. And we were in Calgary and we were doing a show and we were doing Hell on Wheels on AMC yeah. and we just met. And then Ants and I, um, you know, over just chatting and like, oh, what books are you reading? Oh, what books are you reading? And then we just started overlapping on, oh, you're a fantasy geek. Ah, ah. What? <laughs> yes, fantasy geek? No. Yeah. There? And then he's like, and then Anto's like, so uh, you D and D? And I'm like, <laughs> and I'm like, no, but I really, really always fantasized about it because I was the guy who did like Ian Jackson and Ian Livingstone books by myself in my room, like just rolling dice, like choose your own adventure, like in a corner, like some sad sack in between, like hockey games, you know, like you know, what are you doing over there, Burke? I'll just play this you know and like yeah. um, and then he's like oh there's this whole other world that I can introduce me to and I was like I've always read about it I just said <laughs> out I've never had anybody else to play with <laughs> and it's like you know this sort of like and with that twinkle in his eye with that sort of come hither like oh who will show you what for my friend <laughs> and, and then I got completely like you know, wrapped in him and so honored and, and very, um, and very scared. I was very intimidated <laughs> by these guys. Like, fact. That is, that is an absolute fact. Like, I was very, like, I remember being, like, just, how do I do this, whatever. Anton had me over, like, a couple of weeks before at his apartment in Brooklyn, and he was like, all right, we're going <laughs> to roll a lot of character. Let's go. And I was like, this is intense, but... Like, and it was like, I was so excited and like the whole benefit of the character and then, you know, the name and who you're going to be and like, you know, and he's like, read a couple of these first, like, see where you might feel like you fit in best and like, <laughs> I to think about this and like, you know, and just completely like, just, just taking care of like, you know, this, this young upstart rap stallion who's going to come through and like join this already established poker game so, so, and so, so. uh had like just moved through and you know just when uh brandon like came and got to us i just had wonderful thoughts and memories and giggles about like coming through and like the the few parties that i was eventual that, that we had all played with at the end but uh just like just bringing it all together and grabbing you know, that, that, um, the, the, the creativeness of the whole thing was completely everything I wanted and everything I imagined, even more. And it just kept on getting better and better, you know? Yeah, completely. I concur. I have to say at the, at the end of it all, I, I feel like, um, fourth edition was not my cup of tea. Uh, I've heard fifth edition is an improvement, um, but we'll probably never find out, or at least not until I'm retired and have the time. Uh, oh, let's get the campaign back together when we're like 70. Yeah. I like yeah. to go back to first edition. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And Anson, you were a great DM. You were yeah. 100%. You were very good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Part, part of why I got this group together was. I remember how much fun it was because, you know, as Phil pointed out, Anton was very, very focused. Uh, it was a great uh, ringmaster, you know, getting the whole thing, you know, getting getting Phil. And he's not only the DM, he's also apparently a, a counselor. Um, uh, it steered this young steered this young man towards D&D &D and off the streets. And, uh, and part of the fun was honestly kind of messing with Anson because Anson was so like... He does so he had done so much homework and he had taken he'd done such a good job preparing this adventure for us. And now he's got to corral like four 
dudes around a table who are kind of like drinking and smoking and stoned stoned and <laughs> and occasionally having to like guys what are you going to do and we're just like blah, 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 blah. really it was the, the weed the, it was really the weed once the weed came out i was like okay we're going to let we're going to get i i have prepared an entire dungeon and they're going to get through like one room because they're <laughs> And then, and then Anson has not focus. It's like Anson hurting. Has to, yeah, hurting cats. So you have to be Anson has to be the disciplinarian. And okay, we're like guys, what are you doing? Okay, guys, y'all are sinking into quicksand. Like, where did that come from? Like, I just invented it. And you're sinking in quicksand. <laughs> Do something. Like, oh man. <laughs> well, yeah, half the, half half the fun that. was kind of fucking with Anson. Like that slug yeah. character yeah. was absolutely my joy. I know it caused you so much grief. <laughs> I loved Splug so much. Well, <laughs> tell, tell us about Splug. Yeah. yeah, what was Splug? I forget. So Splug was a little character that we interacted with, a, a goblin or something. And like, you know, he gave us some information and we decided to take him prisoner and carry <laughs> him with us. And then, you know, every time something would come up, we'd, you know, they'd be like, oh, well, there might be a track. I'm like, okay, we, we tie a, a rope around Splug and we roll him down the hallway to see what <laughs> and, we were just constantly. Finally, we were like, you know what? Enough. Splug is dead. Splug is dead. And I went, so I take up Splug's body and I <laughs> my back are holding and whatever we need to do. Be like, I take out Splug's corpse and throw it at the wall to see if there's a button there. There's no button. There's no button there. It was like Weekend at Bernie's. With Splug. <laughs> <laughs> and then eventually it had to come up with some reason like i don't know he like he burned up in a fire or something he had to like basically take your toy away from you your, 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 your splug multi-tool that was you abused until your, until dad had to take it away it was oh. always so funny as well just having like you know just like a bunch of us guys giggling and then like jordan being ostensibly always in la yeah so he would he was always being you know Copper in virtual reality style, and you know, it's like he he had his own he had his own map being made, and then it would be like you know we'd be giggling, you know, may or may not be moving pieces closer to something, and you know somebody would make some move, and you know they would look over and see and go wait, you guys heard that? What? Hold on, did you guys move any pieces? And then Jordan would be like, what? Hey. Wait, hold on. Are people mumbling pieces? <laughs> well, wait, I'm called sorry. And then we have to discover, like, who actually made a move. And then, you know, me being the Tubi and all this kind of thing was like, you know, I'd always be like to Rick or to David and be like, I can do this, right? Can I do this? And then Anthony was always close to the left of me and be like, yeah, man, you can do this. Don't worry about it. And the guys would just tell me, yeah, just do it anyway. Man, like, no, 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 you know, you can't do that. Wait, wait, oh my. You know, and Rick and David completely like feeding me to the wolves, you know? <laughs> well, I remember we would spend like sometimes hours debating certain mechanics or certain special yeah. skills. Uh, how to, far you jump. <laughs> if we were to go back, uh, one thing I would definitely change is I would eliminate all maps. Mm. Let's like ma not maps that you want to that you you guys want to keep to chart your progress, but I'm talking about uh, play maps. Yeah, yeah. grid yeah. maps. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It becomes a it becomes a board game at a certain point. I'm like, no, right. it's not a board game. It it it's it it takes too much away from the imagination. I think, so so do. what is it? What is your ideal of what D and D is or should be? Well, when I grew when I growing up with first edition, there were no maps. Like it was just. You just saw the situation in your head as the DM explained it, and you would like, um, you know, if if there was a if you wanted to do something that required a certain distance, you would ask how far away you are, and he would tell you, and it would just it moved it flowed a lot better. Also, mm -hmm. um, and then I think it was with later editions that, um, and I think ancillary where like third party companies started building models. Yeah. yeah. And then along came uh Warhammer, which everybody got really into like, you know, the specificity of of tabletop um uh landscapes. Wow. And I just 
it's just not the same. Yeah. Well, and, well, I just want to jump in real quick. You had asked me, and I and I didn't really come circle back to it. Like, was that the first time I had played? I had actually learned how to read playing D D when I was in like third grade. Wow. Um, and that was that was like my first and it was not really a full campaign. Um it was really more of a way to, you know, to learn to teach reading. Um and uh and then throughout high school I had several, you know, sort of attempts but we never got past rolling up characters because we would spend so much fucking time doing that <laughs> that we'd be and we'd get too hot. Um, so by far, this was the most sort of engaged and an actually thorough experience I had ever had of D and D, um, in spite that history with it. Well, you know, the, one of the interesting things that that the that D and D shares with with reading, and I don't just mean because there are books, uh, but you know how when you read a, a novel, um, you have kind of a picture in your head oh. of the environments you're going through and the characters have a kind of look to them. A lot of it's taken from your own experience, your own world, or you plug in a famous actor or something like, you know, you're seeing, you're seeing the story play out in your head in a way. Yeah. There are in that, that's, that's what, that's the engine that, drives D&D, right? You have to have a very healthy visual imagination. There are people who do not have that at all. Yeah. Really? And, yeah. I was yeah. thinking, I think, it, and forgive my ignorance in this kind of, this thought, I just, you know, maybe it's because of, you know, the world that, you know, we we all sort of um, travel in, in the moment. Uh, you mean, is it kind of like, um, and again, forgive my ignorance. Would it be like dyslexic imagination? Maybe, but more like they're just reading information, right? They're just reading it's like just, it's just factoid yeah. after factoid after factoid. So they yeah. would think sort of like more binary. They don't necessarily so as, think. Yeah, as they're reading, they're not they're not picturing it. Like it's just this is information. This is what happened, and and it's it tend to be the people who aren't into reading. Yeah. Yeah. That's really cool. That's kind of like, that makes me think of my father sometimes because he's an engineer and he's very mathematically driven. However, he is very Irish and very um, um, creative in his own way. Wow. And he doesn't necessarily think the way that I think about certain things. So it gives me pause to think about those that, you know, oh, you know, it's just a gelatinous cube that you know, sucking up everything and then melting it in a thing. Like, like you, you, you can't even know what it's that. <laughs> or they're just you know? thinking, they're just thinking about like how many hit points it has, and you know, uh, just the you know what its right. what its abilities are. They're not really visualizing the thing floating there in front of them. Uh, yeah. Right. Uh, uh, one other thing I just wanted kind of talking about full circle. So I, you know, I was raising two kids as we were playing and the kids grew up watching me play for hours at a time. <laughs> and now my son, he's DM'd a bunch of games and like, oh, wow. Awesome. Uh, he's heavy into it. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Um, and they have a whole server that they get on, but they're still going analog, but they're communicating. There's like a whole system. It's not about Skyping in. It's like all of their character sheets and stats and everything are there in the, uh, in the heads up display, yeah. but then they roll dice still. Oh, cool. Oh, yeah. 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 I'd say the, the thing that I probably appreciated the most about it was the, I can't think of another experience that's quite like this. The group imagining. No, no, no. But, uh, it's one thing to have a relationship between a book and your imagination, but to have a collective imagining is a really special thing with it, with this game. Uh, for the you know four or five of us to sit around and project ourselves you know, with our imaginations into this space, and take it seriously enough to um, 
imp- try to improvise. And that was the, that was the most fun was like the, the group dynamics of all of us figuring out what each of us could do in um, a given situation, what our strengths are, uh, weaknesses, et cetera. And, and coming up with a plan, which sometimes took forever because we were <laughs> slow and there was a lot, there was a lot of reading of books. That was the thing that my wife used to laugh yes. at, but she would walk through the room like, what are you doing? It looks like a study session because it's mostly just like five guys with like three books open. Like, mm, no. yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> and, well, and like, it, and sometimes if there were only, if there was only like one copy of the player's handbook floating around, it yep. was, it was like, you know, come on, man. I just, I, you know, give, give it to you. You know, there was like this like anxious <laughs> tension about the look at the book and who's driving kind of. But I, 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 picking up your point though, I love that it is a collective narrative, right? It's, it, 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 um, and it doesn't progress until, you know, we basically agree on the course of action. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's always some kind of, uh, hybrid of what each of us would have done on our own. Um, And uh, yeah, that, I, that was a really and, fun aspect. And usually better than what one person would have come up with. You know, it was right. like really yeah. comic in that sense. You know, yeah. Was, and she was vetoed too often. Yeah, <laughs> like, <laughs> she, like <laughs> you know, somebody be excited mm. about, oh yeah, let's do this, and then everybody be like, no, that'll take too many turns, and then it's just no, <laughs> oh, God, we, no, we, like there's going to be nothing there. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, how just talking about, uh, you know, as, you know, Phil started out talking about like rolling up a, c- a character, well, we have to meet, we have to meet all of our characters, you know, so we'll start with Phil. When you, when you were presented the options, your possible, uh, uh, career options inside D and D, uh, what, what did you go with and why? Well, I don't Thank you, Ben, for asking. I um, really appreciate that and uh, the opportunity to come to you. Um, my character was uh, Bon Langlois, um, who was a, uh, that was the name of the character, oh. and it was a, a cross between uh, two of my uh, favorite musicians, my, uh, one of my favorite uh, rock stars, and uh, Bon Scott, lead singer of ACDC, and Paul Langlois, the rhythm guitarist from the Tragically Hip. Um, there were many, uh, opportunities that were presented to me, um, thankfully to my wonderful counselor slash DM and to Mount. And, um, you know, he was just like, why don't you just think about yourself, like in this, you know, sort of year and in this world and sort of where you think you would fit. And, um, I didn't go crazy. Like, um, you know, some people will, you know, put themselves in you know, half dragon people or like, you know, yeah, we'll get to that one. And, uh, or like, you know, these, you know, Gandalf, that sort of paladin. I went straight to the heart and straight to what you know. And I was like, no, this guy's definitely a rogue trickster elf. Like, you know, this guy is definitely like, you know, he's a, he's a tipsy guy. Just somebody you can, you know, there's somebody you like to have a beer with in the bar. You know, he'll get the story, he'll be listening to everything, you know, all at once. And, but he's a guy who can open locks and he might be able to steal a few things. And, you know, he can he can help the group in ways. And also, I believe there was also, like, Amson's like, you know, we actually need this party in order to progress the narrative. These <laughs> <laughs> guys, these guys definitely need a little help. And this thing is like, yeah, um, maybe this way, at least, like, lean over in here. So we, uh, so I was, yeah, I was the, uh, I was the rogue tri- trickster elf and, um, and it was amazing. And, uh, I mean, we could talk about it later, but, uh, uh, living where I do now, uh, in the wilds of BC, we have been in and out of a campaign here for the last couple of years, but, uh, but we'll leave it there for now. And, uh, I still use the same character, which is, is quite amazing. Oh, wow. What's the name of the character? Yeah. Bon Langlois. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Wait, Bon Langlois? Langlois. Yeah. Okay, so that means good something. What is it? Uh, I think uh, if you were probably the 
take down Paul Langlois' name and like go down through uh, Quebec and, and sort of maybe that northern Ontario um, mix, it's probably be like good good words at some point or uh, good, good okay. language. Yeah, yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah, which I I didn't necessarily realize at the time. I was just completely picking like two of my favorite rock stars. <laughs> Wasn't uh, wasn't Andrew like a tiefling or something? Somebody was like tiefling. Oh, I remember the tieflings. Yeah. What, what was and what was David? Since he's not here. Oh, so we can David. Uh, um, was he a? No, it was writ- who was the like straight up like sorcerer? There was somebody that, was that like, was me. That was uh, Faye. That was Rick. Right. Yeah, that's Faye, what I thought. Right. Faye the Milf Slayer. <laughs> yes. And when we would check into Brandon's apartment, you had to write down your name. And so when we would meet for the D&D things, I would write in Faye the Milk Slayer. And apparently you guys got in trouble for that one time. Yeah, apparently the doorman uh, yelled at Sharon like, who is signing into your apartment as Milf the, Faye the Milf Slayer? And like, <laughs> and, uh, and, 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 and Sharon was probably playing ignorant, like, I don't know who that is. It's his, his name is Faye the Milk Slayer. <laughs> and 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 the, and and the, and, the, and the person um, and uh, the doorman got really really angry. Like this is serious. This is not a game. And I'm like, actually, it is a game. <laughs> I don't know. Oh man! Wait. And what were you? What was well, Barnsley, what, wait, Barnsey was like a? Uh, I would say he was like a priest or something yeah oh, like a, he, 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 maybe a paladin or a or like no something. i think he was like a cleric a cleric yeah yeah. Yep. yeah he was yeah, like because like, dino maybe he was always the one at the back it was always like rick was sort of if i remember correctly rick was like spelling you know he was the guy that would spell from afar like you know gandalf-esque and then dino would be like and oh yeah man so our best fun We'll be like, and that's 30 hit points. <laughs> and, you know, oh, hey, look at that. You rolled another two. You know, like, err. And then, like, and then it'd be like, oh, I'm dying. I'm dying. And you know, we'd be like, gotcha. Here you go. Gotcha. Here you go. No bother, boys. We're on it. No bother. <laughs> medic. <laughs> Brand- I remember Brandon's yeah. character. Yeah. yeah Brandon, was you like were the, the medic. He was the medic. Mm-hmm. Who was? Barnes. Dave, David, right, right, and Brandon, you're you're your character. The muscle, Sinax. yeah. I look, look, check this you're out. The workhorse. I made this. I made this in mid journey. This is my. There he is. Thing. Oh, and there's your familiar. No, your head. Oh, oh, oh nice. Uh, there's Silax. <laughs> yep. Yeah, Silax was a half dragon paladin, and uh, he could kind of shape shift a little bit, uh, but it took too many turns, so I rarely did. But he was kind of the tank. Um, yeah. And and you get real big. Get I real could get big. I yeah. could get big. I could get big. <laughs> and um, my favorite thing about that character was I had a special ability that when I got in, in the middle of combat and I got too many, got very wounded, I got dro- dropped below a certain hit point. So whatever, I it engaged this thing called Dragon Rage. You know, I'd become enraged, and then it would add, you know, points to all of my die rolls. And uh, but Anson got a kick out of it because I didn't know that I would enter this state until I kind of did the calculations. So we're all sitting there again, like nerds looking at books and pencils <laughs> and erasers and stuff. And then everyone is like fighting the game. And I'll be like, Oh, wait, well guys, I just realized something. I'm enraged. I'm enraged. <laughs> <laughs> Very calmly. Yeah. Yeah. I'm enraged. <laughs> I just, I just realized that I'm enraged. Or, or like, or I think I'm enraged. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then we'd wait, argue about it. Wait a second. Wait a second. I think I'm enraged. <laughs> <laughs> and then I know that Jordan. Uh, well, first of all, who was your character? So my character was was Pack the Wise, and he kind of depending on which campaign. Even though it was one sort of endless campaign, but we I, I remember we rolled up sort of fresh characters because we were working with a new edition at one point with four or something. But he started out as sort of a battle mage hybrid character. Um, I think he I want to he was like a a bard or a monk kind yeah. of guy. He definitely didn't have any uh, edged weapon. 
he shot darts <laughs> and had like a staff. But I did get two attacks because I was a, you know, I had a double handed weapon or a two handed weapon. Remember cool. that about him? And he was kind of fey. <laughs> Yeah, oh, that's right. He, he he frequently employed his flaming spear. Yeah, yeah. He had a, he he. Everything was flamey, like his flaming yeah. darts. <laughs> he could do a little flaming spear. <laughs> oh, he was he was the most fabulous. Of yeah, the, of he the was campaign. Very, and, and he would like kind of like pop into like through a time portal, and that was sort of how we, you know, he kept on kind of yeah. being in and out. And then he would go into like with, with jazz hands. Yeah, with jazz when he, when he came out of the portal. Yeah. yeah, and I I picture him now, now, like in a frozen state, like just stuck in ice with with his jazz hands. <laughs> well, I what I, I remember like we had we, we went on a hiatus for a while. Oh my god, my cat's tail. What? Sorry. He knows where the attention is. Yeah. Uh, uh, we went on a hiatus for a bit. I don't remember. And then yeah. when we reconvened, we were playing, and suddenly your character was just kicking ass and like just slaughtering people left and right and and the answer is like flag went up and like what how what? are you doing this and it turns out you've been going on other campaigns while we were on hiatus and your character was collecting was leveling up and collecting yeah uh, collecting more power so you were like uh, what level you were on like much so you were like slumming it with like kindergartners and you were like already yeah, like I, I had been you're, you're in high my- school and yeah yeah yeah, that yeah, exactly. I built up I I built up his stats, but it had come to buy it naturally in game play. It wasn't like I just plugged in the numbers. No, I did I wasn't accusing you of that. I was, I was thinking it was yeah, funny, But you didn't tell us that you'd been doing extracurricular development and I then know. you come back and suddenly it was like, Yeah, again it was like the high schooler comes back and is playing like little league and like, why is he like kicking ass so much and i i like to think of it like robert johnson like he i made a deal with the devil i went off and i came (laughs) back and i knew how to play guitar how did you how did you uh uh deal with that anson because it did it was kind of disruptive in a way because like yeah you shut me down i think we're really some adjustment i I think i told i think i told him that he can't he can't just magically have blipped out and gone on a different campaign. <laughs> so I think I, I, yeah, I remember making some adjustments or there were certain abilities. But it's I, because you can't yeah. really design a, uh, a campaign for, you know, you know, four fourth level characters and one 12th level character. It, just yeah, that's doesn't, I, no. it does not work. No. I think I was maybe, I was frustrated too, because I, I was a, a hybrid character. It took me longer to, yeah, to do that's each right. thing, yeah. and so that's why I was thinking like, and I think I missed a couple of sessions, and maybe that's where it went because I was like, well, yeah. I want to, you know, as, as if I had been playing along, um, but then I I went too crazy with that. You know, when I when I reminds me of that. Uh, started, started taking uh, performance enhancing drugs. He came back all roided up and. Like, I can't. Yeah. Well, I no. It was more like <laughs> I I got I probably took my guy through more sort of things that are more experiences and a you know a, anyway I got I took it too much I took it too far <laughs> and I'm First sorry that that probably <laughs> wasted all kinds of time. I was in uh, sixth or seventh grade, seventh grade, I think. And, um, you know, it was just a group of guys. We'd go over to each other's houses and play. And at night I would go and I would read the books. And I just, I just loved them just every night. And one night I decided, you know what? I'm going to give myself a special treat. And I found this thing. It was called the, the Tooth of Delvinar. I'll never forget <laughs> that. And I just decided that my character should have it. And then we were probably like fifth level at this point, fourth level. And this was something for like, a 36th level character. (laughs) (laughs) Like I came in and, and I just used whatever magic power and smited everything. And my friends were just like, what are you doing? And I'm like, no, I played another campaign with my cousins and like, you know, like this. And they're like, no dude. And I remember just holding my ground and standing up and being like, well, then I'm leaving if you don't trust me. And so (laughs) now for the first time in a decade, Yes, I lied. I gave that to myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no. I, I, I put myself through the delusion of of like going through actual rolled up 
I went, I put him against like rolled up, you know, monsters and stuff like that. And then forced my son to play. <laughs> well, it makes me think of like, uh, but it's almost worse. Know, I think it's almost worse. No. <laughs> it makes me think about, um, uh, uh, like the entrance of, uh, well, that's just, I don't know the loud boy, like, you know, the aura and everything. And like, it was always, uh, and it was always TV was coming in with that. But then it also makes me think of, um, of the South Park where they did the, um, the video game Is that- uh, episode. Oh, with, yeah. Um, I see yeah, that. And they, um, what was, it was, uh, yeah, what, was, what was the video? What was it again? It was that big MMO where the guy like was so strong he just killed everyone. That one, and the yeah. boys together to try and like kill you know hedgehogs and stuff to gain enough points so they could take him down. Yeah, was it uh, Warcraft or yeah. uh, World of Warcraft? Yeah, Warcraft. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> it's like completely like knocking off all these two point bits in order to level up and all this kind of stuff. That's great. And coming that back, like, all of a sudden, just Jack, you know, Fernando Tati. Oh, sorry, I was off for 138 games. Don't worry about it. Came back. I'm cooked. Whatever. It's Completely crazy. Completely decimating. I think it's crazy. Um, and take, and uh, Barrett, sorry to interrupt, but Bear's noting how much, like, just the basic mechanics of hit points leveling up is is just pervasive throughout any kind of gaming culture in video games and everything and that's all comes from this place oh, know? yeah um it's it's amazing how those mechanics have like uh just pushed through all these new media and i don't know it's wild yeah that's that's true i never thought about that Go yeah you can see act. it you can see it still in most video games yeah, right? Exactly. Hit points, levels, you know, acquiring new abilities. Um, here, I, I wanted to throw out a, a, an interesting thing, just thinking about building a character. I think it would be interesting to, <laughs> as, an, as an acting approach, to actually roll up your character and, and, roll, and, and then base your performance on, on the character that you roll up. Let, let the really? dice determine where, what you know, the acting decisions you're going to make. But I also just think it's interesting that they call it building a character, that you're rolling up a character. I don't know. There, it, There is a lot of the craft in, in the game, I think, when you think about it. I think, the, the, I think that's, that's really, that would be an incredible exercise. That would be wonderful <laughs> to take on, actually. I think that would be, that'd be pretty cool. Um he made me think of something else there as well, and I think this is maybe one of the reasons that Anson uh, gave me um, the opportunity to join you guys was um, the whole, uh, I'm a huge Dragonlance guy, and I was going through, and I knew that the impetus and the sort of, like, I suppose, otherwise the catalyst for that whole series was basically they took their characters and they started writing um yeah. Uh, yeah. they started yeah. writing the the, the dragonlance novels became worldwide series boom boom you know which was uh i think besides maybe the hobbit was my uh, my initial foray into you know sort of fantasy world which is now you know where i love and and live and breathe many times um <laughs> but uh you know, the way that, you know, that narrative of, you know, starting that character and also relating it to um, the video games that you're talking about, you know, yeah. it is very sort of, you know, sort of Campbell-esque or Joseph Campbell as far as, like, the more experience you have, you know, the better off you're going to be able to take that, you know, or make, you know, more plausible decisions, you know, whether you whether you succeed or fail, you know, that's going to continue taking, you know, your hero's journey, you know, so on and so forth. And, um, you know, just going back to us talking about sort of there are people that don't necessarily have like a creative mind that can't think that way that will talk about maybe hit points rather than thinking about these 
wonderful background. Like, you know, I think about, you know, sort of more on a Tolkien net. Oh, look at that beautiful oak tree that's been there for a thousand years and I'm sleeping under where it's like somebody's like, how much shade am I getting? You know, is there warmth here? Am I recouping, you know, by, by, by my hit points or whatever, whatever it is, but just sort of like, it's interesting the way that you can dis- decipher. I don't know if decipher is the right or appropriate term, but you can sort of, you can break it down. It is something that is not oh. really, you know, you know, something I was thinking about is like, you know, when I was a kid and people were talking about D and D, there was this, you know, it was de- demonic and, you know, you yes. should like it do it. Oh, right. But like yeah. some of the things we've been talking about, like the skills that you come out of it, you know, democracy and working together, you know, the math skills, the, the reading skills to kind of understand there's, there's even like a, a precursor to, you know, law like what we do is you know with the dm if we say hey i want to do this and the dm says you can't we've got to look in the book and say well based on this and this and if you add this and this you know therefore ergo i can shoot this fireball you know like it's all of these different tools that kids could be learning to take in the real world certainly ones that i took and use nowadays um i wonder why we don't you know think of it more as a you know you have sports which is great for physical activity but why don't we have you know, as much emphasis put on these things that create imagination and, you know, other skills. Well, uh, that, well yeah, that was fantastic. I know I, we, we still, you still have some questions for uh, Nathan Stewart, right? Anson? I just had that one about the displacer beast. Okay. Well, <laughs> you, you, I, think, I think you can probably uh, ask him yourself. Oh, <laughs> hey. Hey there, how are you all? Hey, how's it going? <laughs> good. We were just reliving the good old days. Oh, and really? Your uh, yeah. your own campaign? Yeah. Yes. Very, very, very quick, Nathan. Uh, could you just introduce yourself so that I don't waste time? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Nathan Stewart. I'm the vice president of marketing for Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, yeah, happy to be here. Thanks for having me. We all love the movie, and I'm gonna just jump straight into it. Anson has a very serious question about uh, about the movie. About the movie, yes. All right, let's hear it. Whose idea was it to use the Displacer Beast? Because I thought that was old school badass. Oh, um, wow. That one, I really am not sure because uh, so much of the process was collaborative. And when talking to the writer directors and Jeremy Latch and the producer, uh, and my team, you know, we were like, what are, what are the coolest monsters, right? Like what are monsters that are like uniquely D and D that are both, you know, uh, iconic D and D, but also unique to D and D, right? So that it's not like generic monsters. And so I don't know if that one came from, uh, from Goldsea daily, if that one came from Jeremy Jarvis on my side. Uh, but definitely we had a lot of fun brainstorming, like which monsters to prioritize up on the top. And uh, yeah. and once we saw the vi- uh, once we saw the visual effect target for the displacer beast, we were all like, "Oh my god, that's amazing!" Well, <laughs> and you also had the same scene. You had the mimic and the gelatinous cube, were, and all of those are first edition. Oh D- yeah, yeah. I mean, we tried to use as much uh, you know OG kind of content and and D and D stuff as we can. I think the uh, gelatinous cube definitely came from uh, Goldstein and Daly because you know it was a big hook in the uh in the plot in terms of how that they progress from that scene on and so i think they had that scene like very visually in their head and so they they definitely were the ones pushing the um the gelatinous cube the mimic the displacer beast uh i don't know if you noticed like there were baby rust monsters uh in one scene when Holga and uh and oh, uh, yes yeah and they yeah. were walking yeah. up like to get their yeah. heads cut off right right like all right. that stuff was either came from my team or was like the kind of collaborative process but uh but gelatinous cube was definitely the, the directors were that's awesome could I, I i wanted to ask were there any that you guys like when you're talking you know kind of uh spitballing ideas for monsters were there any that like you everyone was really excited about but that didn't make the cut uh, there were a lot of kind of, um, I guess, kind of to Anson's point, kind of like first uh, first edition or OG monsters that we 
at brainstorm different places to put them in. And for one reason or another, either the, the scene didn't work out as well, or obviously as we know in, in these movies, you get a, a, a finite special effects budget, but like when you, they were going into Neverwinter for, uh, for the high sun games, uh, you know, we had a couple ideas that there might be some cages for monsters that they were bringing in to put into the, uh, in the Coliseum. Uh, and I think, uh, I'm trying to remember which one we had. We definitely at one point, I think, wanted a roper uh, for some reason, you know, just because it was like fun. Um, and uh, and definitely we're, we're trying to talk about if there were other like uh, OG monsters. I'm trying to think of the one. It's like a Zorn, I think, is the, uh, is the other one that we were talking waiting, about. Like, I was waiting for the purple worm. Purple worm, I think, would have been kind of overpowered in that one. <laughs> yeah. 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 Or the manticore. Uh, yeah, that would have been cool too. Um, uh, yeah, I think in the, um, in the arena scene, you know, you kind of got an opportunity for lots of different ones, but, uh, but yeah, we, we kind of stuck to the, those two and I thought they did it really, really well. Oh yeah. They were amazing. That was my, are you, so is our, now does my question is because Hasbro's now is now the, is now the company, right? Does, so does wizards of the coast still exist under the Hasbro umbrella? So Hasbro's owned Wizards for like 20 years, 25 years or okay. something now. So nothing's really oh, changed okay. I didn't in realize, that relationship. I didn't realize that. Yeah, nothing's changed in that relationship. I've been working for uh, on D&D for about a little over 11 years now, and I'm pretty sure my paycheck has said Hasbro the whole time. <laughs> you know, we get direct deposits, yeah. so I've never seen a paycheck, but, you know, but we've always been Hasbro. So, um, yeah, they bought, um, they bought Wizards. Oof. I don't even know when it would have been maybe 2000, 2002, 2001. Right. Um, so we, we operate pretty independently, you know, magic and dungeons and dragons and dual masters, uh, are made out of wizards here on the West coast. And, um, you know, and Hasbro, uh, worked with us real well, always has, you know, I love the, the folks over there. The only difference now is, uh, when E1 joined the Hasbro family, uh, and as D and D kind of rises in uh, mainstream popularity, especially with the film, we've just been doing more stuff between the groups, right? Like I don't know if you've seen some of the toys, but like they made D twenties and the monsters that converted and and uh, and cool stuff like that. So the relationship's been there forever, but uh, it's just now we're working more closely together than ever. Also, the president of Wizards of the Coast, um, Chris Cox, who was here for about five years, uh, you know, he became the new CEO of Hasbro when Brian Goldner passed. And so I think that that was a lot of it too, right? We were kind of just up here in the Northwest doing our thing. And maybe there wasn't as, not, as much connective tissue. And then Chris Cox is like, wait a minute, like, why aren't we including more, you know, wizards and Hasbro stuff together? And, and so now we just talk a lot more, but the relationship's been there forever. Now, were you, were you a player before you started working with Dungeons and Dragons? And if so, how early did you start? So... To answer the question in reverse, I started playing uh, in 1988, so I was about 12 years old, and what got me into gaming in general, uh, and keep in mind, I've been in gaming as a, my professional career now for 24 years or something, so what got me into gaming in general was Dungeons & Dragons, so uh, I moved around a lot as a kid, went to lots of new schools, I was always the new kid, mm. kind of never really felt like I fit in, and, um, and when I was uh, living in Southern California with my aunt, my older cousin, we're like, he's like eight years older. He was like, I was like 12. He was like 20 or maybe even more. Maybe he was 22 or something. Right. So I, I thought he was the coolest. He had a motorcycle, video cameras, all kinds of cool. And he invited me to play Dungeons and Dragons with his friends. And I didn't have, you know, um, I did, I hadn't made a lot of friends in that uh, area yet. And also, uh, I always wanted to hang out and his friends, but I could never do the stuff they were doing. And then all of a sudden at the table, right? Mm -hmm. I was just, I was just Flint. I was just a third level fighter. I wasn't like the bratty little nephew, Nathan. I was, you know, I was my character. And so I loved it. I fell in love right away. As a matter of fact, I wanted to play all the time and they had jobs, girlfriends and all this stuff. So, you know, it was way more limited. So I'd read the player's handbook, like a, uh, a shopping guide, right? I'd like go through like a Sears catalog, looking for what I wanted to get enough gold to buy. <laughs> I started playing back then. And then when I moved uh, again, uh, you know, I didn't have that gaming group. So then I kind of switched over to uh, Commodore 64, playing like Bard's Tale and Wasteland and Ultima and it started playing that. So then I got hooked on RPG video games. Uh, and then, you know, I dabbled uh, and played lots of tabletop stuff through the years. Uh, but when they called me uh, to, uh, to recruit me for this position, 
I hadn't played in a while, and I hopped back into the uh, game stores and started playing during fourth edition, and and I just fell 100% back in love with it and play all the time now. Can, can I ask what your current character is or your favorite character? That so played? currently I am dungeon mastering a game for my nine-year-old daughter and her friend and his parents and my wife uh, in terms of stuff. So I've been dungeon mastering more lately, but my, my go-to character is a pastry chef named Ganache. Secretly, he's a rogue assassin, but I don't think anyone would go around saying I'm a rogue assassin. So, like his picture, he's got a baker's hat, like he's got baker's tools. He's got a a, a forged identity that's uh, got like employee of the month uh, from Lord Neverember's kitchen, right? That he forged is like proof that he's a baker. And yeah, it's funny. I want to play with you. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a deep backstory, man. I love that. Look, look how eager you all made this right now. Like, do you have a room around the table? You have yeah. I love the visual of like I'm a I'm a baker who just happens to be hanging out with all these warriors. Yeah, I'm right? the I'm traveling like, chef. Hey, can I tag along? I'll, yeah, I'll cook for you along the way, right? Yeah. Um, you know, so I get I, I play uh, I played a handful of games with um, with Joe Manganiello and his and his friends, and there was this one game, and Joe always teases me, and he's like, "These are not the hands of a baker, right?" And I'm just always <laughs> laughing at it. But one time we're playing in this thing, and I'm just sitting there, kind of like as lookout or whatnot, and someone comes out, and I just draw back my bow and I shoot this arrow, and I natural twenty crit, and so the arrow goes through, and the dungeon master goes. And as you see this arrow strand slice through the night, all of a sudden it goes right into his eye and you just see a little poof of flower. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Great. so um, I love it's fun. I mean, that's the fun part of it, right? Is just getting it, getting into your character. Yeah, yeah. Right. I was just going to say, sorry to interrupt there. Uh, I love, uh, so love to meet you and honor to meet you. You're a huge fan. I don't and, know, thank um, you. I, I just, uh, it's funny that like as a baker, uh, you would just have this sort of bow and arrow just hanging around in your tool bag. But I'm like, I was thinking of like some Jet Li sort of like, you know, it's going to be knives, it's going to be like a butter knife, like, you know, <laughs> no, it's fake. That's, well, that's, this, kind, of my, know, it, that's kind of my, back, bow, that's kind of my backstory on why I've got like the thieves tools and the little stuff and everything, right? I'm like, oh no, I used to decorate cakes and, you know, it's so, like when I'm picking <laughs> locks and everything. But I think like the bow and arrow, I mean, if you think about if you were hanging around the Forgotten Realms, like I don't care if you're a farmer or a little kid or whatnot, like you've got a bow or a sword or something, right? So I feel yeah, like that when they just look and they're like, yeah, of course, why wouldn't you, right? You don't have to be a ranger and have a bow and arrow, but like you got to eat. So I feel like it fits the story, but definitely when they're like, why do you have all these thieves tools? I'm like, no, no, no. These are pastry chef's tools. This is for decorating for, you know, fine, uh, you know, fine elements and stuff. So I definitely try to like play off the other stuff. Like it's baking. But does oh, he have the, the cooking skill? That's my question. Or is, uh, the, is that even an option in the, in the, in the skills? Well, believe it or not, I, I actually have a little out. bit of pull. So I, I, I made them write, I made them write some rules for me that allow that. Yeah. Ah, uh, nice. Yeah. Wow! Hey, I have I have, a, I have a question. It's good to be uh, the king, guys. We we all, the last time that we played was was during fourth edition. Um, it, as I said earlier, at the end of which I decided it really wasn't my cup of tea. Um, I've heard good things about the fifth edition. How has it been received? And sort of what was the what was the um, animating? What what was the driving force behind creating a fifth edition? Um, well, first of all, I'm surprised you have not played fifth edition yet. Cause let me tell you it, uh, I think you're going to love it and I hope you guys are getting back in. So, um, fourth edition, I, I rather liked fourth edition. It was fine. Um, I, I definitely accept lots of the critiques made about it. And the critique that I give it is that it's just, uh, it's, it's really low level on the RP part of the RPG and really just getting into encounters and combats and fights. Right. And then the other criticism I make about, uh, fourth edition is um I, I call it a two beer edition like i can't have more than two beers while i'm playing otherwise i start forgetting the stats and the stacking and my turn all of a sudden it gets to me and i'm like not progressing the game as well because it's kind of too it was kind of too rigid on, on on all the rules and what you could do on your turn and fifth edition i would say that the main goal behind it was uh fourth edition really had polarized a lot of the of the different players in terms of um, what they liked and didn't like about D&D. And so we started getting people that were really, 
they were D and D players, but it was like almost their badge. And I'm like, I'm a three E, I'm a four E, you know, I'm a, a second edition. And so we started getting into this kind of a addition wars, right? Which is really counter culture on Dungeons and Dragons, right. which is everyone's welcome at the table and cooperative. So, you know, if we had been that divisive with the rules, we, we really needed to change that. And in addition, the world at large in terms of how they were playing and and the advent of Twitch and streaming and, you know, theater of the mind becoming a little bit more theater of camera and stuff. So when we made yeah. fifth edition, it was really meant to be much more approachable, much more streamlined so that everyone could start having fun right away. And that you weren't waiting for your turn to like jump in and take 15 minutes into your turn, but everyone was like, you know, kind of collaboratively going back and forth and much, uh, you know, much more emphasis on, uh, the storytelling and the and the role playing elements around it, uh, and a couple things in fifth edition that just helped streamline everything, which is uh, advantage. So in fifth edition, you have advantage. So we roll two d twenties uh, and take the higher of the two, or disadvantage, where you roll two d twenties and take the lower of the two. And at the time when Jeremy Crawford, Mike Murrell, Rodney, and all those guys came up with it, I didn't understand how revolutionary it was. But when you're playing. It streamlines so much in the game and just gets into the intent, which is storytelling, because you've got these big moments where it's like, oh my God, am I going to, oh, heart failed, right? Or everything succeeded. So, fifth edition really was meant to bring players from all editions back in uh, and get them around the table and feel like they belong there. And then, secondly, it was meant to be really approachable for new players coming in so that they, didn't feel overwhelmed by all these stack and rolls and all this crazy stuff, and they could just have fun with their friends. And if I'm being honest, if you're if you start playing in second edition, it feels like home. Uh, if you played in fourth edition, it's actually not as strange as it would seem. And if your third edition is probably where you're a little bit more like, I liked all the components of spell casting and the rituals of this and all the stacking elements, and so this is maybe a little, this isn't as kind of tactical uh or or kind of as uh as as complex as i liked in third edition but it's it's pretty amazing like it, it really did streamline the game and people coming to it have universally uh praised how much easier it is to get into it and now more people have started playing D in fifth edition than any other condition so uh, uh edition so it's it's the largest you know kind of group of new native players uh, i'd heard that was something that came out of the pandemic right a lot of people did, did, was there, did y'all have an up? Did I imagine that that there was an uptick in? Oh, we definitely saw an uptick. Uh, but no, I am guessing right around when Tasha's Cauldron came out, which would have been before the pandemic, um, that we probably tipped over in terms of having more of the more new players coming in. Uh, you know, we we came out the the new version came out in 2014. Um, but we really started gaining, you know, massive popularity and, and new player uh, growth by like 2017, 18, 19. We were we were seeing a ton of new people coming to the hobby. The hey. pandemic really uh, probably increased like the the number of games people were playing a week and the and the play around the table and probably brought in some some new players surprisingly. Uh, but uh, but it had been it, the catalyst had started before that. Was it Stranger Things? That was a part of it. We didn't see a direct uptick right away on Stranger Things, but we definitely saw uh, like a, a continued new player interest after that uh, in terms of it. So it's I don't I don't particularly think that you can pinpoint any one show or one moment, right? Yeah. But at that same time, Critical Role was gaining a huge popularity. Uh, you know, Joe Manganiello and Matthew Lillard and Deborah Wall were coming on our streams, like you know, telling everyone like hey whatever you thought a dnd player looked like you're wrong right like look at us yeah. you know so we had a lot of uh, different moments but the strangers things definitely helped bring back a lot of laps players right because they saw that and it really sparked that oh yeah i remember how much fun it was playing with my you know so we got a lot of that yeah if i may uh just interject there quickly uh going back and uh, bouncing off bridges question it is like uh I remember, you know, sneaking off early in the morning and going to Brandon's in Brooklyn and meeting the lads and, you know, we're having a day out and we're playing D&D. &D. And yet there was this stigma. And I remember my girlfriend at the time going like, well, are you going to dress up? Like, <laughs> yeah. you know, like, you know, there's that still like that whole like, wait, don't you dress up? And I was like, darling, look here, that's LARPing. Okay. I know. Like, you know, <laughs> and there's, there's still this whole 
I, and then I wanted to ask you uh, subsequently, like now, especially with the popularity of this wonderful movie, which I think is fantastic, uh, huge fan. I've watched it three times already in the past week. Um, but you so nuts that Brando came through with his whole deal. So it's great. It's all coming streamlined. But people, and I'm, I live out in the wild of BC at the moment. Um, but people are still like, you know, we have a campaign going and, you know, now I'm 41 and I started when I was 27 with the guys and we start this new campaign and like, we take over, you know, one of the two bars and this island that I live on. And they're like, well, don't you guys dress up? You have your own dressing room. <laughs> like, you know, what are you guys like? Who's to and who wears the wizardry hat? You know, and you're just like, all right. Like, yeah, I don't know. My point, my, my question being like, do you still find the stigma? Do you still feel that there is that sort of, um, not that there's anything wrong with Larkin at all. In fact, I'm quite yeah. intrigued by it. I've just <laughs> so, never really done it. It's 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 funny because, yes, we still do get it. Less and less and less, right? I mean, the more you see people playing, the more stuff. But then it almost works a little bit against you when you see all of the cosplayers and streamers that are going to conventions for any fan hobby or whatnot, right? And so, right. like, when I went right. to see the movie at, here in Seattle with my, with my family, I mean, there were, like, three or four people who dressed up to see the movie. But that's not different than going to a Marvel movie anymore either. So I would say that, yes, we still get the questions a lot, although less. But with the kind of rise in cosplay as such like a, a big hobby for everyone, uh, you know, they're not even LARPing, right? Like they don't, they're not even playing a game. Like at least on the LARPing, they're going out for a weekend someplace and they've got rules and they've got factions and it's organized play. And it's like, you know, it's really serious. But like people just as a, I like to dress up and I like to be inspired by you know, Captain Kirk or Spock or, you know, Hogan or whatever kind of stuff. So, yeah, we get it a lot. I mean, I think the biggest stigma that um, that we like to try and overcome is this kind of concept that, you know, any of us are, are playing quietly down in our basement and ashamed, right? It's like, no, 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 we're playing in the bar, we're playing in the dining room. My, you know, my daughter's school, uh, you know, they're starting a D&D club. We've got, you know, like, we've got middle schools that are starting clubs and other things. So, yes, we get that question. I think that question is more like, a, wow, I'm surprised that Dungeons and Dragons is so popular. When I was growing up, I thought it was this super niche corner case thing. And it's like, yeah, yeah we used to be sub pop. Now we're pop culture. Yes. Hey, That's going, awesome. going on with stigma and yeah. maybe it's too political, but like as different states are banning books and things like that, has there been any kind of, you know, backlash to D and D to your books, to the culture, to anything? From those entities? Surprisingly, I have not seen anything. I would ban our books before lots of the ones they're doing, right? I mean, in terms of, uh, you know, content. But I, you know, I got all the Google Alerts for all this stuff. I got the PR agency and stuff. I honestly have seen nothing. Um, truth be told, if they did, you know, me and the marketing team would turn it around as a badge of honor and, like, run with it. But, uh, <laughs> you know, no, not yet. Although, I will tell you a funny fact is... Um, we, uh, when we go, when we come out with a new book, especially I was talking about Tasha's Calder, and that was number one on the publisher weekly. You know, like when you do a new book, there's always the publisher weekly it was number one in nonfiction. Ugh. And I'm like, nonfiction. They're like, wow. yes, it's a, uh, um, it's a manual. It's like a, it's like a cookbook. It's like a how to like, yeah. okay, sure. Yeah. Dungeons and Dragons, nonfiction. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Fantastic. Wow. Nice. Do you cool. guys have any? Uh, do you guys have any involvement with any of the D and D conventions? We try to uh, coordinate with as many conventions as we can. We're going to be going to uh, Gen Con later this year. We work very closely with Luke Gygax, uh, the son of Gary Gygax at Gary Con. Uh, there's a little one out in Wisconsin. If you get the chance to ever go, called Game All Con. That's super fun. Um, we have a, a small presence at San Diego Con. Obviously, last year was a big deal because the movie. This year, we'll just have some panels and playing uh we do a lot of the local ones i don't know if you guys have ever seen pax um it's a big gaming convention they've got i think three or four a year uh and then we do a handful of other ones actually uk games expo is the next uh uh one we're doing um i think it's in about a month uh maybe even three weeks um so we we do have our calendar where we send folks we organized play there's this guy uh dave chris who runs bald man games and he'll he'll organize games you know about like hundreds of tables for people to play games there and we send 
um, uh, adventures and dice and swag and all that stuff. So, uh, fair bit. Yeah. I got a guy on my team who that's kind of his full-time job. Okay, cool. Do you want to go play it one soon? <laughs> no, I was thinking about we we somebody brought up the fact I had totally forgotten about this. Uh, it, and the, I promise you, this is not a way to pitch you, but this uh, I wrote a screenplay about D and D play. It's oh, you did? Good. It's really good. It's good. It's Revolves really good. around a, a campaign. It's pretty good. We and, I, and I thought it would be fun to organize a reading at one of the conventions. Oh, that's a great idea. Actually, yeah. I love well, it. I love fun. the idea of it as a reading. Well, I mean. You know, if you're serious in this, and we can talk about it after, what I would say is selfishly, uh, next year is our 50th anniversary, and I'm going to be doing a lot of cool and special things around conventions and events, and even looking potentially to throw a big kind of D and D 50th birthday party down, probably in Los Angeles in April. So, I mean, I think there'd be oh, some cool opportunities for stuff like that, but I'd want to make it more like, you know, more like a special thing and not just a random convention. Right. Yeah. No, I, I had no idea. Yeah. That would love to do something involved with the 50th anniversary. That would be amazing. Well, we're smack dab in the planning right now. Um, so, you know, like let's connect after this and definitely, yep. uh, definitely talk about it, but that's fun stuff, but that's the kind of thing, right? I mean, we love our community. We love the creativity. We love creators and pulling these fun things together. And I think that's one of the special things about D&D as a brand, as opposed to lots of other gaming brands is an idea or concept like that. We're just like, yeah, let's embrace that. That's fun, right? Like players will like it. People will like it. And you're like, but how does it point back to your game or sell a DLC? And I'm like, you don't understand. Like we just want people thinking, reading, playing, you know, being together in D and D like it, it's, it's a lifestyle as much as it is a, a game or a hobby. You know what I mean? It's, it's just a culture. It's, yeah. It's kind of part of who we are. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. We were just talking when we first started uh, this conversation, we were talking about our favorite thing about it is this is the social aspect of it. The the, the group imagining. Yeah. It's, uh, we can't think of any analog. I mean, there's, there's other, there's been, of course, other role playing games since and right. others out yeah. there, but we were all introduced to this um, through D&D and it was this, um, I can't think of anything else, you know, that allows people to enter into an imaginative world together and cooperate socially in a real time kind of way. I'm not saying anything new. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty <laughs> special though. I mean, I think that's why I've loved it. I have to ask, Brandon, I have to go on a minute, but I do have to ask, uh, Dragonborn or Cobalt behind you? Uh, Dragonborn. Okay. I can't cor- tell this. I can't tell the size scale and it's not uh, like a hundred percent on a model that I've seen some like could be a Cobalt. Some people like Cobalts. It's it's my description of my character when we played uh, okay. Salax uh, uh, as fed to Mid Journey, and that's what Mid Journey came up with back there. No and, kidding. Yeah, that I just descri- yeah I just described my character to Mid Journey, and that's what it came up with. And before you go, I just have one question for you. I'm still hung up on this uh, uh, on this chef character. Uh, Ganache. Here's, yes, Ganache. Ganache. Uh, gosh. So, like, uh, does does die die rolling? Do game mechanics play into the actual cooking? So, like, if does he like if he rolls a one, his souffle collapses or burns the? <laughs> you know, we've never done any of that, but I okay. will. I, I will actually next time. Uh, yeah. we've got one of the DMs that uh, particularly likes my backstory. Maybe I'll bring that up. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah he, you have to. You have to create a a, a dish in order to advance to the next dungeon. Or just roll like, oh, you just made the worst looking cake I've ever seen. (laughs) Yeah, right. Well, it'd kind of be like a uh, deception roll, right? If it was like, you know, all of a sudden I'm trying to play my part and someone comes over and they're trying to taste my food and like, crap, I don't know how to cook. And like, so all of a sudden, (laughs) instead of a deception roll, it's like, uh, can I fake this dish well enough? (laughs) Or or if it's a natural 20, maybe they get like dysentery or uh, food poisoning. (laughs) There we go. It's the opposite. Uh, (laughs) All right. Well, thank you all for having me on. I apologize. I have to jump, but it was uh, no a pleasure talking to you all. Thank you for taking the time. It was a lot of fun. Right. Yeah. All right. And I'll follow up with the answer on your, uh, on some stuff for the 50th. I think it'd be really cool. That'd be awesome. All right. Thank you all. Take care. Nice to meet you. Thanks, 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 Bye now. Bye. Bye. Wow. I I have so many oh. questions. That was so great. cool. That, that was great. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, I did. I did, and I want to say, I feel I like didn't, we've just, we've just, we've, we've just touched a, a bit of immortality. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say that I didn't know right. he was coming. I didn't know he was joining. Yeah, it was, really, it was a surprise. 
Nice. It, it was a surprise for me. And like, uh, it was I, a I, surprise of the surprise. It was. I know. It was a ruse. And I thought it would be kind of cool if he actually showed up. And then I sent, do uh, you know who you know, I've been in th- to, I've been contacting him through Mari Tanaka. Remember Mari Anson? Yeah. Oh, and of course, Rick, you know Mari. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, she works at Wizards of the Coast. Oh, that's oh, right. Hey. You told me that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. yeah oh, so that's right. So I've been emailing and uh, texting mostly through her and directly to him, too, but I've never heard back. So I just thought, oh, well, he's busy or he couldn't get approval or, or something. I, I had no idea. And then uh, eight minutes till two, while I was, you can probably see it in the video, I get very distracted. Um, yeah. I, I was like, he popped up on my messenger like, hey, are we doing this? I'm like, you sure? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're in the middle of it. Hop on. I, I didn't know. Awesome. I, yeah, yeah, it was great. Awesome. I, was, I, was so glad he, I was so glad he showed up. Man, there's so much, there's so much more to talk about. I wanted to lean into Rick's question that that line of questioning the whole Satan panic of the mini, yeah. and and you know those people all had children. Like I mean, like that you know those, that culture still exists, and I wonder, but they're very clearly have backed off from it. You know, uh, so I think it's interesting. I. I think well, this is my this is my take on it right now. Conser- uh, all right, I don't want to make, get all political, but you know, certain yeah. people, let's just call them conservatives, need something to fear, something to kind of uh, define what the uh, other is, something I mean, they can fight against and feel righteous against. And right now, it's uh, trans and groomers and that kind of thing. So I think they're distracted right now. This whole like um, groomer panic is the satanic panic of the yeah, uh, you know. Uh, I went to Catholic school and had our D and D books discovered, you know, in the back. Back and the nuns stole all of our D and D manuals. Wow! Yeah, for, for that reason, because it was, you know, yeah, um, questionable, right? A cult, yeah, a cult day short, or or they wanted to start their own campaign. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> there's the sitcom. There's the sitcom. D&D playing nuns. I cut to a shot of them all sitting in their basement, you know, around a table. Nuns. I'd watch that. that. <laughs> I played that game. It's got plus four. <laughs> hey guys, I gotta go be. Uh, I gotta go be a daddy. Okay, all right. Good, all right. you do that, this man. Awesome, guys. Well, Thanks, so, man. This, this is this, this is, is great. Goodbye for for me. This is goodbye to everyone. Great seeing you guys. Yeah. Big uh, love. Maybe maybe we'll do it. Again. Get together, have another game. Yeah, you know he got me. He got me convinced to try five. I gotta say, uh, yeah, me too. I'm yeah, in. I'm in. That's what I'm in. That's what I, that's what we've been doing here. Actually, okay. I'll, do, I'll just I'll uh, on the I'll, island. I'll just go. I'll just get a divorce. And, no, no, or a babysitter. no. Well, I'll have. Maybe the time. we could give it to Chat GPT to be the dealer. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and not a bad idea. Let's see what happens. That is not a bad idea, man. That is not a bad idea. And Chat GP will Chat VT as DM will start off every single reaction as like, I think throwing a battle axe at him is a good idea. <laughs> Maybe blah 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 blah. It can be a lot of fun to throw a battle axe at something. That's an interesting question. Yeah. Um, or uh, as, a, as an as an AI language model, I do not encourage this. Or we could we could. Uh, could lure my son into to DM. He's he's now done Ooh. it a couple campaigns, so that yeah. might be a second right. generation DM. That's the yeah. So anyway, all right, all right. guys. Till next time. Big love. Take care. The Well is produced, recorded, and edited by Anson Mount and me, Brandon Edgens. Special thanks for this episode goes to the guys, Rick Nagel, Jordan Bridges, and Phil Burke. Thanks for making this reunion possible, guys. It was a blast catching up. And an extra special thanks goes to Nathan Stewart from Wizards of the Coast for stopping by and answering a few of our very nerdy questions about the movie. And an extra thanks goes to old friend Mari Tanaka, who put us in touch with Nathan. Thanks, Mari. Thank you, everybody. Until next time, have a great time.